Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Now, I love movies and games featuring battles in space, but in the real world, military operations in space is largely the domain of intelligence gathering spacecraft. There's no Starbucks or Luke Skywalkers or Wedge and Tilly's flying spaceships and shooting at things, but there is actually one case on record where a pilot flying an aircraft demonstrated the ability to shoot down a spacecraft and in so doing became the world's only space ace. Now I'm sure most of you are probably aware of the US Air Force program where an F-15 was used to launch an anti-satellite missile. Heck, it's one of the things that we've done in Kerbal Space Program more than once. But the details are always one of these things I've never quite covered. Now, early on, the US recognized the strategic importance of space for communications and intelligence gathering. And because of this importance, they also decided it might be useful to be able to deny an enemy access to space. And so the US Air Force started developing anti-satellite weapons. There was the Bold Orion, and later on, there was the High Virgo. Both of these were launched from aircraft. And in the 1950s, one of these actually put a target vehicle or a warhead close to a satellite, close enough that had it been armed with a nuclear weapon, it would have killed the satellite. However, the Eisenhower administration really weren't happy with this. They demanded the program be suspended because they, you know, well, officially they wanted space to be something of a neutral ground and they didn't want to have any demonstration of hostile intent. And of course, later it would be discovered that detonating a nuclear weapon in space would also generate a massive electromagnetic pulse, which had the potential to indiscriminately damage electrical systems on the ground. And the lingering beta radiation from the Starfish Prime test spread around the Earth's orbit for months and it actually killed several other satellites in the following weeks. Incidentally, if you've ever watched the SpaceX live broadcasts and wondered where test shot Starfish got their name, now you know. The Soviets would also develop their own anti-satellite systems in the 1970s. These were all co-orbital satellites that were launched from the ground. They had none of the glamour and sexiness of uh, you know, Commander Jameson at the controls of his uh, Cobra Mark III. And yet yeah, all the recent tests by China, US, Russia, India, all ground launch systems, they're all dull, impersonal affairs that are not worthy of action movies. No, the 1980s F-15 test, that's the one we are interested in. So this system was called the ASM-135 ASAT. It was a 5.5 meter long multi-stage missile with an infrared guided kinetic kill warhead. The first stage was adapted from an SRAM-69 nuclear-tipped air-to-ground missile. The second stage was derived from an Altair-3 rocket stage, and it had little hydrazine guidance uh, steering thrusters on. And the final stage was the miniature homing vehicle. And let's not forget the most glamorous part of this whole thing, stage zero. The glorious F-15 piloted by a bold human who would pull the trigger or push the button or you'd do whatever it took to commit this launch to its target. And for the one and only test against a live target on Friday the 13th, September 1985, the pilot would be Major Doug Peterson. The system would require carrier aircraft to fly roughly to the right spot near the satellite's projected path. And I used to think that the aircraft would actually have to be facing the incoming satellite so the sensors could, tr could track it. But it, when I actually looked at the playback of a heads-up display, it's flying at a completely different bearing and the missile actually approaches from the side. The aircraft bearing was 295 degrees. The satellite would have been coming from roughly the south because it was in a polar orbit. Now, uh, sources claim that for this test there was also a Learjet loaded with tracking equipment that would also be feeding data there. So yes, Major Pearson didn't have to use the force to shoot this thing over his left shoulder. When the aircraft was at the right location at the right time, the missile would be armed and the pilot would pull up in a 3.8G climb with full afterburners. By the time he hit a 65 degree climb, he would be at about 38,000 feet the missile would drop and then the booster would light. And that booster would carry it out of the atmosphere, aiming for a point in space and time where the satellite would be. 
The second stage would push it faster and closer to this target. And then once that had burned out, it would turn itself to face at the target. It would have to turn about 90 degrees to see the incoming object. It would pop off the covers for the, uh, the walk kill vehicle so that its sensor could finally track the target. It would spin up the kill vehicle as well, and then it would detach it. Um, so yeah, the kill vehicle would be spinning at about 35 uh, RPM. Uh, the second stage also contained a coolant system for the sensor. The sensor had to be cooled with liquid helium to a temperature of 4 Kelvin so that it would work with sufficient signal to noise. The kill vehicle was a tiny cylindrical object. It massed about 13 kilograms and it included a thermal sensor, a guidance computer and a whole bunch of thrusters to make course corrections. It wasn't smart at all. It would simply try to null out any lateral velocity. The computer didn't actually know where it was or where the target was. It would just try to keep the uh, target in the center of its reticule. Uh, so, you know, they targeted some of the tests by pointing at a star and getting it to null out and keep it in the frame. So the sensor, yeah, operated at about 4 Kelvin, which is why they needed the liquid helium. And the F-15 carrier aircraft, incidentally, had its uh, ammunition magazine removed. It had a whole bunch of the rear seat removed so that they could have a helium container, a dewer, that would actually feed the or keep the missile cool as well. The, the tracking sensor also wasn't an imaging system. It was a very simple detector with like a cross and a spiral pattern etched onto it in using the sensor material. And as the uh, warhead spun, it would cause these blips as it passed over these, right? So by timing these blips where the thing is sensed and not sensed, and by knowing the shape of the sensor, you could figure out where it was, where the target was relative to the vehicle. And therefore you could then compute what kind of uh, thruster pulses you would have to perform to keep the thing on target. The thrusters were interesting. These were tiny solid rocket motors and there were 64 of them arranged in a ring around the outside. They would each fire for something like one tenth of a second, basically giving a little kick in, to, in one direction. So the computer would have to figure out which way it wanted to go and then it would have to select a thruster and wait until it had rotated into the position so that when they fired that thruster, it would give it the kick that it was required. Eight of the thrusters would be half uh, size so that they could get finer tuning. And uh, also because they were worried about propellant contamination getting, you know, messing up the thermal signature, it was apparently a special green propellant that would you know, reduce the thermal signature or something like that. So the original plan for the test had been to launch special target satellites that would help provide extra feedback. But when they were ready for their uh, live test, these weren't ready. And for various political reasons, they pushed forward and decided to target a, um, a science satellite called Solwind. This had been launched in 1979 by the Department of Defense as part of its space test program. And notably, it was the first satellite to observe a comet and it actually discovered the Kreutz Sungrazer groups. But by 1985, Solwind was failing. And without careful management, you would get a low power state. The three data recorders were not, no longer working. So the only way to do any science was to have a live link from it and get data down from it. So it was considered that this was essentially dead, but scientists were still using it. And days before the test was about to occur, people figured out which satellite it was and filed a lawsuit supported by politicians who you know, didn't like the idea of an ASAT test. It went before a judge and the judge said that they felt that there wasn't any way to stop this. And so the test went ahead on the 13th of September. And so Doug Pearson over the Pacific performed his uh, maneuver, released the missile and it went, it flew straight and true and it hit the target. And with the kinetic energy equivalent to about 100 kilograms of high explosives, it shattered that satellite into hundreds of pieces of debris. And so Doug Pearson became the first and so far only pilot to shoot down a target in space. And his F-15, by the way, it was called the Celestial Eagle.
Afterwards, the debris cloud was investigated by NASA scientists, including some guy called Kessler, uh, who had expected the torn material of the satellite to be bright and shiny, but when they looked at it, they found that it was way darker than they expected. The force of the impact likely vaporized plastics and atomized the remaining propellant on board, and the result was a layer of soot on all the pieces. 285 pieces of debris were catalogued, and I think the last one fell back to Earth in 2008. The test satellites would be launched later that year, but a day later Congress essentially passed a law that shut down the program and they weren't allowed to launch anymore. And you know, this is an interesting one because obviously I'm not a fan of anti-satellite weapons because of they're not great for the environment of space in general. But in the deal to get this program shut down, they agreed to more chemical weapons facilities. And that's not a bargain that I necessarily think I, I would take. But yeah, of course, since then, we've seen uh, anti-satellite demonstrations performed by the US for using a, a ship-launched missile, Russia, China, India, etc. So yeah, Doug Pearson, the one, the only space ace. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.